Is this on video? Yeah, do you mind? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, because <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I like tone my hair. <laughs> I uh, I put it up on YouTube eventually, just so that people have, you know. More if you people. want. I mean, we don't have to if you're not comfortable. No, it's fine. You do okay. your thing. Because we, we already have one of it. <laughs> like the last one you did. I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube. <laughs> <Am I liked? laughs> no, no, you look good. No, you look, you look much better be in that smiling. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. It's that time of the season for Chris Gwynn. Hello, Chris Quinn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, fall's coming. It's it right is around coming, the corner. Yeah. It is what coming. is the first day of fall? 20th? I think technically the 22nd. 22nd. Is the first full day of fall. So next week yeah, is the first up. full day of fall. Um, we like to have you back as often as possible. We didn't get you at the beginning of the summer. So many things got in the way of that. But uh, let's, let's recap. How did the summer go? For the uh, park service. Well, yeah, for, professionally, the summer the summer went really well. Good. And so you know, everybody was wondering, you know, what is visitation going to be like? Who's going to show up? Is anybody going to show up? We had a lot of things closed. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of the summer, uh, we weren't doing programming, but uh, you know, we were very fortunate. At the beginning in June, we we started to be back out on the battlefield. We did a whole slew of hikes, walks, talks. People showed up. Yeah. They're here today at the Museum and Visitor Center. Uh, you know, visitation's really good. It's. Uh, I, I was very pleased to see that uh, the battlefield was busy, uh, even on Sundays, which I yeah. always thought like Sundays were the days everybody went home. But I guess, you know, I don't know if 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 previous visitation patterns still hold up. I, I don't think, think I they think do. Visitation's evolving, especially you, with COVID. You know what? It dawned on me the other day is that a lot of people uh, still aren't working. A lot of people aren't working. A lot of people are teleworking still. Yeah. Um, so you've got more time to do yeah. things. Because I noticed even in town on a Sunday night, if I wanted to get a table at a restaurant, I had to wait 45 minutes. I've never had to do that on yeah. a Sunday. So, yeah. I mean, that's great. I think it's good. I think it's good for the economy. It's certainly good for the park. It's certainly good for the, you know, the interpreters and the historians working, um, be it you know, the licensed battlefield guides or us out yeah. uh, you know, on the battlefield. You know, we uh, started to do a Culp's Hill tour recently mm -hmm. to uh, just... Bring visitors out there, draw attention to the recent you know, rehabilitation efforts, and we've gotten amazing numbers on those programs. So it's uh, it's been a very positive summer. Um, the uh, for an interpretive ranger, it must feel good to be back out amongst the people, right? Like you don't get into that job because you want to sit behind a computer. You want to be no, there. No, it's it's mix you, it up. You usually get into this job to do the opposite, right? <laughs> that, right. <laughs> we're a we're a place based agency, right? Yes. So we want to be site specific, and you know, being out on the battlefield is, is where we want to be. And yeah. Engaging with visitors who want to explore the battlefield. That's yeah. that's our bread and butter. Yep. Um, all right. So, what are the uh, interpretation plans for the fall? Anything exciting coming up? We got a lot. Oh. So we're still doing programming. Okay. We're still doing programming. So uh, we plan on offering a. You know, as many hikes, walks, talks in September and October as we can. October is usually the busiest month of the year for us. People think it's July. It's not. It is October. Yep. Uh, beautiful weather. It's a great time to be in Gettysburg. So we're going to be offering, again, as many programs as we can. We're at Culp's Hill right now doing walks. We do them in the cemetery. Uh, we are partnering with uh, Gettysburg College and the Journal of the Civil War Era mm -hmm. for some special events this Saturday, September 18th. Okay. Uh, we're going to open up some of the historic structures on the battlefield, specifically the Warfield House, yes. the Bryan Farm. We uh, are fortunate enough to have Dr. Hillary Green, who's a uh, University of Alabama uh, professor, who will be speaking as a, a special guest campfire lecturer at the Park Amphitheater at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Uh -huh. These are all free, so I hope people show up. Sure. Uh, talk about some cool things. You mentioned the Bryan Farm, and Bryan Farm. I just realized that uh, I, this is something I should have done almost a year ago. Um, but uh, you helped us when we did the Today Show. Mm -hmm. You opened the Bryan Farm for us so we could go in and show it. And they didn't use any of the footage. <laughs> <laughs> but um, still, I... I <laughs> and, and Chris and I kind of spent about a half an hour 
playing peekaboo around that giant bush. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. The right right out of the shot. So you get the shot, <laughs> and it was all for naught. But um, the and it's funny too because the producers of the Today Show really loved the virtual tour we did. They're mm. like, we thought this was going to be an S show, but you guys did it. You pulled it off. It was great. And they didn't use any of it. But anyway, I'd like to thank you for helping us with that. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, I'll my be pleasure. very late. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so. Uh, w- the, the Warfield, have you been able to get into the Warfield house yet, or is that going to be a new There's thing There's been fall? a handful of times we've opened it up to the public, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it's still a work in progress, mm-hmm. right? So our, our structures preservation team has done just a tremendous job of taking that building, and I, I usually describe it as this kind of Frankenstein building with all these modern additions yeah. built off of it, uh, and, and peeling those away to reveal the 1863 building, you know, deep yeah, within. Right, right. Um, so we, we had it open over battle anniversary. We had it open um, for a couple of special virtual programs. Mm-hmm. But it's not a, a house that you can step into any time. So when we do open it up and allow public visitation, it's you know something you should check out. Um, there there are no plans to, I know, because there are no other structures on that property, but are there any plans to try to, I guess, recreate like any of the barns or outbuildings that might have been there? No, no, not right now. And that's not something the Park Service does a whole lot right. of honestly yeah. um so you know we're not going to rebuild the bliss farm that's burned during the battle right. we're not going to do it and there are a lot of reasons why we don't do it one oftentimes you don't have enough information mm-hmm. right? what does it look like well, we have you know the archaeological resources that may or may not be beneath the surface in the case of the warfield property very little photographs of any kind mm. at least not period photographs and so, you know, a lot of times rebuilding something, reconstructing something like that, uh, it's, it's simply not possible because we don't have enough information. Right. And, and you, you guys even... aren't in the business of guesswork. No, we don't right. like to do that. Yeah. We don't like to do <laughs> so that. So that's okay. Um, the uh, winter lectures. Yes, sir. Uh, I know we're, we're way ahead and, and a lot can change, but at this point, what does the Park Service have in mind for winter lectures? We are building out our winter lecture schedule as we speak. Good. Will uh, they be in person? I certainly hope so. I do too. I certainly hope so. I can't promise it because you know conditions change so rapidly, and you know the federal government uh, has very strict mitigations that right. we have to follow. So yeah. We're a federal agency, but you know right now I'm excited. Uh, we, we have a good lineup that's already coming together. We're going to have uh, Zach Fry. I don't know if you know him, but he wrote a Republic in the Ranks. Oh yeah. Excellent. Yeah. If former uh, instructor at West Point. He's now down in Virginia. Wrote a fascinating book, so he's coming back. We have uh, Professor and Dr. Jill Titus from Gettysburg College who's coming Love out with her. a book on the centennial yep. of the Battle of Gettysburg, so Gettysburg in the 1960s. She's agreed to come and speak. Uh, the Ranger staff is working on their programs as we speak. I think it's going to be a great lineup. That sounds I'm, like a great I'm very hopeful we can do it in person. I'm not going to promise it. Sure, you can't. That's certainly at this my point. preference. Um, Jill uh, Titus was, uh, we just put an episode out with her a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about that, but I, had, I recorded it when she was still writing it. And so now we're going to have her back on when it oh, comes great. out. Yeah. I think it's going to be an awesome book. Yeah. It, it, well, and it's a fascinating story, like listening to that time and, and, and how they did the centennial and just yeah. what, a, what a mess like some of yeah. the other ones were. And it's pretty cool. So, yeah, uh, that'll be good to, uh, to see her. Uh, okay. The one question that we always get, whether it's in our Instagram <laughs> DMs or your Facebook or email or in person. Here it comes is what is the plan or when are they closing Little Round Top? For once and for all, Chris, please (laughs) give us an answer because I tell them I don't know. Spring of 2022 Uh at the earliest. So, okay. So wait a second now. So it will be open after this fall through the winter and it will probably close its in spring. Spring of 2022 at the earliest. Okay. You hear that, folks? At the earliest. At the earliest. That's the company line. You got it. Now, all nine months ago, I think the company line was end of the season fall this year at the earliest. Then I heard, and it wasn't from someone that I would call a reliable source, but more reliable than what you hear on the street. Then I heard early winter. Mm-hmm. At the earliest, but now it's spring. Spring of twenty twenty. That's the official the word. Earliest. Yeah, and we that that had been the, the the target for for quite a while, to be honest. Okay. A- anytime you're dealing with a project that is as complex and as big and as impactful as something like 
a rehabilitating little round top. You're working with government contractors. You're working with a whole slew of engineers and professionals. And you know, delays are inevitable. Sure. Timelines are fluid. And so right now we're eyeing spring 2022 at the RS. And this is a big undertaking too. It's very big. I mean, you're kind of you're dealing with rehabilitating a natural thing as opposed to like building a house. Well, you, know, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot more to it, I would imagine. I don't know. You're right. Okay. It, it's, it's a very dynamic place, right? You got a little round top today. There's a lot going on up yeah. there. You have paths. You have parking. You have uh, the commemorative landscape that's on top of the hill. By that, I mean the monuments, the markers, the memorials. You have the, the vestiges of the battle. And by that, I mean the, the breastworks that are mm-hmm. built uh, during the fighting mm-hmm. and ha- having to take all of those into consideration trying to figure out visitor flow and dynamics trying to to take this again very fragile place and protect it so it lasts for future generations while at the same time allowing visitor access right right that is a huge huge challenge yeah and trying to give visitors a sense of of you know what would what it would have looked like in 1863, at the same time introducing these really protection measures right. up there, uh, big challenge. And, you know one of the things we've never done with Little Round Top, we've never done is we've never really told visitors here's how you explore the hill, here's how you do it. Mm. Today, unless you're with a licensed battlefield guide or you're fortunate enough to be going on some sort of program, you park at the hill, you get out, and you're like, okay. <sighs> You know, Just now wander. I, yeah, yeah. You, you and I know about the battle, right? right? So we're, we know. Well, we're going to go up the summit. There's General Warren. You know, yeah. There's Patrick O'Rourke. We're going to go down to the 20th Main. Most visitors have no connection to the hill. Right. And so one of the big things that I hope to see from this project is that visitors will know how to explore the hill. They'll do it in a way that will make the battle make sense, right? And they'll do it in a way that doesn't damage the hill. Mm. And it's going to be a big project. It's going to take a long time, but for those you know folks that are like penciling in a date, you know when's the last sunset I can get a little round up? Uh, spring of 2022 at the earliest. Now the perimeter that is going to close it off, okay? Uh, it, it, how is that going to be? Are people going to still be able to go up Warren Avenue, but maybe they can only go straight? People will be able to drive down Crawford Avenue go uh-huh. through Devil's Den. But Warren Avenue, Sykes Avenue, and most of South Confederate will not be accessible via a, a car or a vehicle. Will people be allowed to walk? Not under the construction zone. So one of the things okay. we're going to have to depend on the professionals that are doing this project is to make sure that there's this very clear demarcation about where you can go and where you cannot go. So uh, hypothetically, let's say the construction zone at this particular time is around the, I don't know, like say from uh, Patty O'Rourke down, down the hill to Warren Avenue, let's say, and, and maybe, I don't know, a little west down the slope to 16th Michigan, and, uh, you know, to the back to uh, Sykes or something, like that little square there. Would someone be allowed to walk up to the Warren statue? Yeah, I'm not going to answer well, okay. that question because I simply don't know the specifics okay. well enough, and I don't want to... Uh, Inadvertently, because that's another that's question correct. people have asked. It's like, well, we can't drive up there. Can we walk up there? Like they they, they want to, they don't want to lose. Uh, no, so, no, which I get. Yeah, I mean, I completely get. At, at the same time, with a project of this magnitude, there's construction equipment. It's an active work zone. Sure. Right. You got to. Our priority is visitor safety. Sure. Above anything else, and yeah. so, you know, whatever whatever boundaries are set up, they're going to be set up to make sure that people stay safe. Okay. Good. And, my you know, my assumption was always. It was basically all of Little Round Top from like Plum Run up over past Sykes Avenue down into the woods on the backside and then everything between the Wheatfield Road and Warren Avenue mm-hmm. and probably a little bit to the south of Warren Avenue. But I would assume you'd be able to still park at Devil's Den and walk up to Big Round Top on that trail through the woods. Devil's Den, the parking assume. area there, yeah. that'll remain open. Okay. I, I don't see any scenario in which access to the devil's kitchen or the summit of big round top sure. would be close to visitors yeah. I just don't see except that. to vehicles close because to you, vehicles. you can't yeah. go down south confederate not, not necessarily close to pedestrians right okay um all right that's interesting that is interesting and so ladies and gentlemen you got a little more time with a little round top at least till spring 2022 at the earliest i just have one more <laughs> okay. question on that line yeah hey, the uh the projected timeline 
that we've heard is is 12 to 18 months. That's is correct. that still the case? Still the okay. case. Good yeah. question, Eric. Good question. 12 to 18 right. months. Right. And uh, earlier you mentioned Culp's Hill and the rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's the latest with that? Well, there's still some, some missing elements uh, of that larger rehabilitation project. So that included a whole bunch of things. Signage. We're working a trail guide right now that I'm okay. excited about. So that would be the new kind of interpretive layer to the Culp's Hill. I think the big question that you know, most of your listeners and viewers are probably interested in is, you know, are, are we going to go back out and continue the rehabilitation efforts of the, of the woodlot? That is. One of the things that we want to be very careful about is we want to make sure that we understand how the hill is responding to what we've already done and how visitors sure. are responding to it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at our rehabilitation efforts here at the park since they started, mm -hmm. so late 90s, early 2000s, I think as a, as a general rule, we were really good at cutting down trees and we weren't so good at maintaining, maintaining the, it, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that's the, the big priority now for us moving forward. We want to make sure that we can maintain what we've done. We want to make sure we can do it in a way that doesn't impact the arch archaeological resources on the hill, that doesn't impact the, the natural environment that, it, you know, it's right. part of the Culp's Hill ecosystem. Sure. And so we really want to be very careful and strategic about what we do next. One great thing, one great thing that we really didn't have before is thanks to our partners in the foundation and the generosity of uh, one of their donors, Cliff Bream, there's actually an endowment that's been set up. Mm. Uh, a pot of money that we can pull from to help maintain and rehabilitate oh, what we've done. Okay. And so that's to have that kind of plan in place. Okay, here's here's what's going to happen when it gets when it gets thick again. Yeah. We're going to dip into this pot of money to help us maintain. So that's good because it really always does come down to money. If you have the money to maintain, then you can do it. If yeah. you don't, you can't do it. The only way, the only way we're ever going to get Culp's Hill to look like it did at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, is to go back to 19th century farming practices. I was just going to say. And we're just not, we're not going to do that, yeah, right? So you're not, not putting cows out there. No. no, okay. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> and so we have to be smart about how we move forward, right? right? It has to, to be uh, like a representation, yeah. but not an exact... And that's why we use the term rehabilitate, right? Uh -huh. It's not a restoration. We're not taking mm. something that is existing and turning the clock back. We're presenting visitors uh, a window mm. into what it might have looked like. It, it is, again, representative. It's illustrative. It is not the real thing. So it is going to continue, though, I, because uh, let's dispel or confirm some rumors I've heard that the uh, rehabilitation, the continuing of the clearing and all that other stuff has stopped and, and the park's no longer going to go through with it. I'm not going to say that. Oh, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> okay. So we got to we're going to monitor what we've done, uh -huh. and then use that to make some data driven decisions about how we proceed. So you're not okay. So I, you've I feel done... like there was kind of a perception with people that as soon as you know phase one was complete, they would you go guys to phase were either two. going to assess to see whether or not it was successful, and then like by the end of the year, the same year. Right. Phase two was going to start in phase three. I don't think people understood. People don't that get that. There, there needs to be some kind of like, not long term, but at least like medium term, short term assessment of how that's actually impacting. Sure. And, and that makes sense. Place. So, I mean, so that's, that would probably be the reason that people are thinking that it's done. And they're not going to continue with it because you're, you're assessing exactly. what you've done so far to exactly. see if it's worth going on. So you're not going to say it's going on and you're not going to say it's not going on because yeah. you don't know yet because the results haven't come in. Is that it's right? A, the the Culp's Hill rehabilitation is ongoing because we're in this phase now where we're looking at all the changes that we made and, and seeing how, again, visitors are responding to it and how the Hill is responding to it. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's just a smart way to move uh, forward. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You know, one of the big concerns I have are, are social trails. So you go up there today and you stand at the summit right by the tower, and we created a trail that you know we hope visitors use to navigate their way down the hill, so mm -hmm. they're not climbing over the breastworks, and they're not right. you know adding to the already significant erosion problems we have throughout the park. And you know, the hope is visitors use that trail and don't create their own. But mm -hmm. I'm already seeing places where visitors are just kind of creating their own trail because they want to go oh. directly this way, or they want to go that way, or you know, what, what have you. And so, you know, those are the kind of challenges we're looking at. And yeah. How do we address that? How do we deal with that? Yeah. Or they're following a deer path, maybe. Following a deer path. Yeah. Either way, not good. Um, okay. Anything you want to add before we go to our listeners' questions? I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Very good. I don't blame you. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Hold on here. Let me get the questions out. I hate this face ID stuff. Okay. Here we go. Bill Richardson, former governor of New Mexico, he says, is there a threat that Confederate monuments may be removed from the battlefield? So I think this question gets to, you know, what is the National Park Service's role in this national debate we're Please having? Please explain it. Yeah. And this is, a, I think, a, a common misconception that people have about the role of the National Park Service mm-hmm. in managing these historic sites. So we are not in the business of putting monuments up. We're not in the business of taking monuments down. We're in the business of taking care of whatever the American people, through their elected representatives, tell us to take care of. Okay. And that's what we do. You're we're going to do it holistically. We're going to do it objectively. So we're going to talk about you know, why the South seceded. We're going to talk about why the individual soldiers fought. We're going to talk about why the war came to be. We're going to talk about the consequences and legacies of it, no matter how complex and contentious they may be. But the National Park Service is going to take care of the things that the American people have told us to take care of until the Congress, their elected legislators, tell us something different. Mm -hmm. So it's no different than the bison at Yellowstone or the fossils at Dinosaur National Monument. We're going to care for those things. We're going to protect them. Um, Okay. Stephen Byers asks, is the Park Service working on updating and expanding their hiking trail system to be more like Antietam's? Antietam has a fantastic hiking trail system. And one of the things I love about what they've done at that park is you can go from the North Woods down to literally Burnside's Bridge and Snavely Ford and cross pavement like a handful of times. Mm. You can explore almost that whole park on foot in a very immersive way. Mm. I love it. Mm. I would love to see something like that at this park. And we've dipped our toes in it with the trails at Culp's Hill, like I mentioned. I think we have a lot of opportunities to. It's a different battlefield though, too. I mean, like, I mean, it's, we're all over the place. It's a different battlefield. Yeah. I mean, it's about twice the size of Antietam, uh, receives far higher visitation. There's a a lot more, what I would call user groups here, right? So, Mm. you know, you don't see the segues at Antietam or the (laughs) horse tours. Right. So Gettysburg's a different animal. It's a different animal. And obviously we have the community in between two halves of the battlefield. And, you know, Gettysburg's seen uh, more growth economically than obviously Antietam has. So they are different animals, but I think the same principle holds true. Visitors... I think 21st century visitors want to engage with historic spaces in yeah. ways that are fundamentally different than how it was done right. 40 or 50 years ago. I see people all the time come to this park, and what they want to do is they want to hike. They want to get out. They want to be in the landscape. Yes, yes. And so, you know, a little round top, which we just talked about, you know, that'll have a new and improved trail system. And so I think over time what visitors will hopefully see uh, are more opportunities to engage with the park like that, that boots on the ground, that immersive experience. All right, very good. Uh, Joe DeFuria, he has two questions. He says, are there any plans to reconstruct any more Civil War era buildings on the battlefield, such as the Rose Barn or the Bliss Barn? Well, we, we kind of touched on that before. Um, but any others that, because I know you said we're not doing the Bliss Farm because See, it's not that. So what we do really well, what we do really well, is we take buildings that are not in the best of shape, and we, right. we take care of them. And so the Warfield Farm is a perfect example of that. We took a house that was, you know, certainly an 1863 building, but had a lot of modern additions. And so you really couldn't understand its spatial 19th century mm-hmm. you know, arrangement. We brought that building literally back to life. Mm-hmm. If you drive on 30, Chambersburg Pike, heading west, you're going to pass the first shot house, yes. the Whistler house. I was meant to ask you about that. Yes. The park has done extraordinary work yeah taking that building turning that clock back and, and giving folks who see it a, a much better idea of what it looked like at the time of the battle the the rehabilitation work they've done there is fantastic the um a lot of missing elements like the front porch have been returned it's a different building it's a different building than it was was you know a year and a half ago i haven't been past it in a while so the the front porch i guess is what i was seeing and i was assuming was going to be like a safer way to get to the first shot marker um but so now i'm thinking it's the front porch that i was front looking porch, at yep. there's so, a retaining wall yes. to keep the building from kind of falling into the roadway great but as part of this larger project there will be public access to the site so you're going to actually be able to pull in and park there 
and then walk to the first shot marker. So you, I guess you'd have to go around the back of the house. There's actually so you don't fall on the road. <laughs> yeah, I mean the park service is going to clearly identify where you're going to park. Yeah, you know? we don't want you parking in the road. Uh, there is actually uh, a small driveway that does allow for some car parking there, mm -hmm. and so you know as one of the uh, next stages of this project, you'll see some of that. No, I'm sorry, I meant like when you park, you're going to walk around the back of the house and oh, not yeah, go yeah, along yeah. the front because there's a bank that yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, number two, his question, uh, let's see, is it possible to clear all the brush trees in the slaughter pen and plum, rum air, plum run area to resemble the wartime appearance? And if so, how can it be maintained? That gets, I think, to the conversation we just had about Culp's Hill and how uh, we want to be very careful about when we cut down trees because yeah. we can make a field, but that field still wants to be a whole bunch of trees. And what you're seeing down uh, by Devil's Den now is really an example yeah. of that. We're using more and more fire as a tool to maintain the landscape. So there's been controlled burns, you know, a number of locations on the battlefield. And I would not be surprised if there was a, um, a burn to try attempt to address that particular area of the battlefield. But yeah, I noticed a that a couple of weeks ago, I was down uh, kind of uh, uh, meandering around Devil's Den, and I noticed uh, some trees coming back where there haven't been trees in yeah, 10 or 12 years. Like a so. lot of sumac. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, okay, Joe Jacobs. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Brian Derenick. Here you go, Brian. I want to make sure you hear that I am asking your question. <laughs> Brian Derenick. Hi, Matt. I have some questions for Chris Quinn. Here we go. One, are there any midweek ranger-led hikes or programs scheduled for mid-October? Yes, we will be doing programming throughout October. Schedule is found online, www.mps.gov backslash G-E-T-T. Very good. Uh, number two, I'm trying to learn more about a specific photo that the Park Service has on their website. Who can I contact to learn more about what may be known about it? If you visit that same website, there are links to our library page, and there's actually a little email field you can uh, use to send your questions directly to the park. And then what we then do is look at your question and direct it to whomever is best uh, equipped to answer that. So in this case, it might be uh, either myself or some of the interpretive rangers who work in the library or uh, occasionally Greg Goodell, who's our curator uh, and archivist, will, will help answer questions. But yep, send, it, send us the information. Can people uh, go in, uh, you know, since John Heiser left, um, I know there was a while, and then I think COVID hit around the same time, yeah. right? So we couldn't go in. That's correct. And to, but can, can we do that now? No, it's, the library's still closed. The library's still closed. It, it's, and it falls under the same kind of... Um, Falls in the same category as the Eisenhower House and the Wills House, both so of which are So it's part of COVID. Closed. Yeah, it's COVID. Okay. Is, uh, is it still possible to somehow get the information from a book there, but not by going in? Like, is there someone to contact if someone is doing research? So there is that email field I mentioned on the library webpage, uh, on, our, on our Park Service webpage. Uh, and certainly you can use that. We get so many requests for material, we, we simply can't. You can't. We can't fill them all. Yeah. We, can't. we do our best. We do our best, but it's, it's just not possible for us to, to provide that level of service uh, <laughs> online. Yeah. Just, we're getting better, but we're not there yet. <laughs> all right. Joe Jacobs, is the park closing at sunset a permanent thing, or will it ever get back to 10 p.m.? This is a heartbreaker for a lot of people. Um, and they, they, this is another question they asked me, but besides what are the specials this week at Mason Dixon, they, they asked me about these little things. And I tell them, how the hell do I know? <laughs> Ask Chris Quinn. So here know. they go. No, yeah. I know. I tell them. I think this is a permanent thing. Correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, and part of it is to standardize you know, our approach to when the park is open and when it's not. And there's actually a grace period after the sunset. Yeah. So it's not like the sun goes and like... You know, Right. Law enforcement rangers come out. And it's, that's not how it works, <laughs> no, right? you got like a half hour. You right? have a half yeah. hour. You have a half hour. And if you look at you know, the summertime, you're actually, in some cases, you're gaining access to the park. You're not losing it. But I understand a lot of people you know, who um, now, like that to How does that work? What do you mean? How does that work if you're gaining it? How you Sometimes gain? the sun sets late enough yeah. that that half an hour oh, puts you past the original okay. 10 p.m. Really? Yeah. When does it? Okay, right but it's the also in the solstice. it's also in the morning too. You, you get yes, you get more time in the morning. Yeah. All right, I get it. Uh, Mark Miller, does Gettysburg MPS have a wish list of properties that it hopes to gain in the future? If so, how are preservation associations made aware when an acquisition is possible? Well, I say we have a wonderful relationship with the American Battlefield Trust, and they've been great at acquiring properties and, in many cases, turning them over to the National Park Service. So it's obviously wonderful. Yeah. How this works is there's a boundary to the park. It's our congressional boundary. And that's 
not necessarily what we own, but that's basically Congress saying, this is how big you can get, right? Mm. And so there's a lot of property within the congressional boundary that we don't own. Mm. We call those inholdings. Okay. So that's a parcel of land that is within the park, but the National Park Service doesn't own it, and therefore it is not protected. A, a great example of that, and, and this hasn't come to the National Park Service yet, but um, Lee's headquarters. Mm. It's clearly within the congressional boundary. Um but uh, privately owned. Right. Until the American Battlefield Trust purchased it, and now, thankfully, it's preserved. Good. Um, have you heard something? Uh, someone sent me an email about Sydney, the old restaurant out there. By, sure, yeah. Have you heard that there's supposedly some proposals for development or something out there? I've heard it, but I don't know you a don't tremendous know. amount about it. You don't know if there's any effort to get a hold of it for you guys to I, take? I, I and, honestly okay. don't. I okay. don't know. Because uh, uh, that, that, I haven't heard about it, but then somebody sent me this email. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I figured maybe you would know. <laughs> All right. Uh, Charles Fuller, he says, what are the basic requirements to become an interpretive park ranger? Is there a certain level of education required, like a four-year degree? Is there a preferred professional background? Well, I think it kind of depends on what kind of ranger you want to be, right? Probably like you. Well, in this case, ranger. a lot of the folks that work at this park, they, they have backgrounds in history. Um, you know, most of them have higher degrees. So you have Troy Harmon, who literally has his PhD. Uh, most of the staff either have their, their master's degrees or are working on them. Mm -hmm. Most of the seasonal staff we have are uh, either, you know, advanced degree holders or they're, they're actively going through their course of study. So, you know, I would say if you really are interested in working at a, a Civil War park, you want a background in mid-19th century American history. Or if you're really interested in working at... Uh, the Castillo de San Marcos down in St. Augustine. Obviously, you want a background in colonial mm -hmm. history. And so, you know, I would, I would kind of um, defer to that in a, in a lot of respects. You have to be able to communicate effectively. That's a big part of it, right? It's a huge you have to be part. Able to, yeah. able to communicate. All federal jobs are posted on a website. It's called usajobs.gov. And you can go on there and type in National Park Service, and you'll see all the different positions that are available. And it will help you apply for those positions. Uh, it's a great way to get a sense of, okay, wh what are what is the park looking for? What skills are desired? What backgrounds? What level of education? And, you know, obviously, uh, with anything, the more education you have, the more experience you have, the better you're going to compete. The National Park Service runs on a GS scale, a general schedule, a general salary scale. And so, you know, a GS five uh, makes less money than a GS seven. And a lot of the times it depends on your level of education and your experience. Sure. Um, and it, once you get into the park service and you say, I want to work at Gettysburg, yeah. <laughs> how, how easy is that? It is not, it is not easy. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's not. Um, I know, I know, cause I know a lot of younger people that say they want to become a park ranger and work at Gettysburg. And uh, and I don't mean to like rain on their parade, but I tell them like this is really hard. Like you might get into the park service and then be assigned somewhere else, or, or you know get a job somewhere else. Yeah. And there's nothing available in Gettysburg for 15 or 20 years, maybe. So if you want a career in the park service, and a career in the park service can be incredibly rewarding, right? I love my job. Right. I mean, my, my job's working here, talking to people like you, going on the bed. It's an awesome job. Right. They're highly coveted, right? There are a lot of people that want to be a ranger at Yellowstone. There are a lot of people that want to be a ranger at, you know, Grand Canyon. Gettysburg. It's Gettysburg <laughs> falls in that same, yeah. same kind of bucket. So what I would tell anyone who is interested in a career in the National Park Service, one, get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by being a volunteer. You can do that by applying for an internship. You can do that by applying for a seasonal job, which tend to be a little bit easier to get. Uh, the Park Service depends a lot on seasonal employees who work the peak periods, mm -hmm. the summer months. Uh, and it's a great way to get, get your foot in the door. You need to be flexible. And you need to be, in a lot of cases, willing to work at places that maybe are not, you know, in your top 10. Right. All right. So I desperately wanted to be a ranger at Gettysburg. Desperately. Desperately. Uh, I ended up taking my first permanent job working in uh, Boston, big mm. city, which I, I hate big cities. <laughs> Me too. I ended up getting another job working in Washington, D.C., which I, another big I, city. I, I hate it. <laughs> it was a wonderful park, wonderful yeah. parks, but the commute, that, that kind of yep. 
it wasn't really my scene. But a lot of times you have to work at these parks that hire a lot of people right. to get your foot in the door. And then, you know, once you're in, it's a little bit easier to be able to navigate to the kind of park that you, you really want to work at. You make you connections. Do. Yeah. And, you know, you got to pay your, your dues the first time. Yeah. You do. You have to work really hard. When, when did you first get into the park service and how many years was it before you got here? So I started here as a volunteer intern working with John Heiser in the park library in 2003. Okay. I was fortunate enough to be uh, hired as a seasonal ranger in 2007. Mm -hmm. Left, ended up working a little bit at Antietam, uh, got a permanent job up in Boston in 2009, ended up moving to DC in 2011, Okay. ended up coming back to Gettysburg in 2012. So it was a while, but not a, a, not a lifetime, well, but it was a while. It was about a decade or so from when, you know, I first started working here to when I got back to Gettysburg in a permanent capacity. And then when, when you came back here to Gettysburg, were you chief of interpretation right away? No, no, no. I was, um, I was uh, an interpretive ranger. Just a yeah, regular just old interpretive ranger. ranger. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you do it, folks. Patience <laughs> and due paying. You got to do it. Um, okay. Is there a test similar to the LBG licensing test that a ranger has to pass? I should have asked that in concert with that no. question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, Dave, just plain old Dave. He would like to know, I know the property surrounding Neal Avenue is private. Gettysburg Daily in 2009 de detailed a prior NPS path to Lost Avenue off Clap Saddle Road. Can Neal Avenue be accessed by this route or only with permission from Dean Schultz? <laughs> Otherwise, if permitted, is there a recommended way to access this lost avenue? Okay. So it's not just Dean Schultz's property that surrounds it. There's other private property. There are other correct? private yeah. property owners. And, and there's a pathway. Well, it's not really a pathway. It's, oh. it's an old right-of-way uh -huh. that the Park Service actually doesn't own. We don't own that. Oh. Um, well, at least not all of it. Okay. The best way to access that property is to work with Dean Schultz. And the safest way. It's absolutely the safest. <laughs> it's the way that's going to infringe on private property the least. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, Dean has been such a wonderful steward of that, that particular location. Uh, yeah. So I'd really encourage anyone thinking of going out there to contact Dean Schultz. We, we, uh, when I first moved back here, my friend and I um, heard about, I'd never heard about Lost Avenue before. And so we had heard about it, and I went uh, into the visitor center, and I forget who the ranger was, but I asked a ranger, I said, uh, what's this Lost Avenue I keep hearing? Oh, yeah, Neil Avenue. Uh, you got to get, uh, you know, you got to get in touch with Dean Schultz. And I said, well, I don't, how do I do that? And he gave me his number. And we called him, we left him a message, and we said, you know, we'd like to come and see Lost Avenue. And he called back within a couple of minutes, and he said, uh, I'll, all right, I'll show you where it is. Uh, you know, I don't do U-Book or FaceTube or anything like that, so I don't want any pictures or videos. I said, fine, fine. Well, so we go, and he meets us in the driveway, and he starts to walk us up the hill. And I thought when we get to the top of the hill and I could see the monuments, I thought that he was going to say, there they are, have fun, you know, come back this way. He went out with us and gave us a two-hour tour. And it, we were, we were having, we were being such nerds. Like it was yeah. the, the greatest day of our lives because this was all, it was like all brand new to us. And, and my, you know, my favorite monument is that, uh, was it seventh, seventh main? main. Seventh yeah. Main, yeah. The shield on the rock. And yeah, nobody, beautiful. nobody ever knows it. Cause it is can't see very it. 19th century up there. Still. Yes. And that's one of the, the cool things about that spot, Neil Avenue is when you go there, uh, I think you feel a much more immediate connection to the past. I mean, it just looks like the Neil's brigade left, you know, right. Not, not too long ago. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. And the stories he has are great yeah. too. I remember when we were standing in the driveway, he pointed at this big Oak tree in front of his house. And he said, I used to sit under that tree with all the old timers who were here during the battle telling, yeah. listening to the story. It's like, wow. So it's like very close it is. with Dean. It is. Uh, Kate Von D, she says, what is going on with the U.S. Regulars Monument on Hancock Avenue? I see that it's partially disassembled. Oh, monument restoration, repointing of the stones. And we have a tremendous crew that deals with the monuments in the park. And uh, they're going to be working on some of the equestrian monuments soon. Uh, they're doing a lot of the repair work for the Lafayette fence in the National Cemetery. A big tree fell and, and hit it. Uh, and they're they're actively working on the regulars monument again, repointing the stone, taking care of the monument. Yeah, okay. We're doing the plaza area as well. So just re yeah, taking care of it. Um, all right, that's it for all the questions there. Um, I know you don't have anything to do with permitting, but I know that I, I had heard that um, 
Um, the park's no longer going to permit walks and runs and things like that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but this is what I've heard. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently, Eric and I got to go um, on the uh, Silkies hike that the Irreverent Warriors did uh, last Saturday, right? Was that yeah, last Saturday? Saturday? That was permitted, I believe. It was yeah, permitted, it was, yeah. yeah. And But I just want to, through you, thank the Park Service for permitting oh, that sure. for them because uh, it meant a lot to them. And it was a real, it's a really cool... Uh, charity and yeah, was, we had a great time yeah, it was I'm great my, my blisters finally subsided last <laughs> night as a matter of fact <laughs> well my, my my hips were screaming for like three days like after that i got to get better shoes to be walking seven miles on pavement but anyway chris i want to let you get back to work here and uh, thank you it. for coming by again absolutely Anytime. we'll see you next time Sounds all right good. thank you all for watching and uh have a good day all right that is it